okay with that? All right. Um, we're going to talk about sports psychology and more specifically about building resilient athletes. And I, I want to talk a little bit about resiliency. When, when I first talked about resiliency some 30 years ago, uh, I, I used to think it was about growing a thicker skin. I used to think it was about building a turtle shell, somehow insulating yourself from what was going on. And, and I came to the realization eventually that it's not about that at all. It's about how quickly you bounce back from disappointment, setback, and failure. Uh, when you think of a ball that is resilient, it regains its normal shape fairly quickly. And so in terms of sport, when I speak of resiliency, I, I speak first of all about growth. Um, the fact of the matter is, uh, if you're coaching elite athletes, what, what you're really trying to do long term is produce really great human beings who happen to be swimmers. Like th th that's, that's the whole essence of it, right? Uh, one of my mentors many years ago, I was the basketball coach many years ago at the University of Victoria. One of my mentors was a man named, named John Wooden, who was a basketball coach. And, and uh, I remember at 25 years of age, when I actually thought I knew something about coaching, I was walking off a basketball floor in Las Vegas with him, and I said what a great coach he was. And he looked at me and he said, I appreciate your comments but we won't know how good a coach I've been until at least 20 years after my last player graduates. Uh, once we see what they've done with their lives, then we'll know whether I was any good or not. And, and I think that's true of all coaches. And so I think that one of the things that we have worked very hard on here in Canada in the last 15 or 20 years is we work very hard on trying to per turn pressure into growth and development as opposed to it being anxiety producing, et cetera, how can we turn it into development? And as you know, in Canada, we have a program now called On the Podium. But that program grew out of a program that was called the Program of Excellence. And the reason that those programs were created was because Canadians, in Canada, we had a really lousy conversion rate. If you were top five in the world the year before an Olympics, and you were a Canadian athlete, only 26% of you would come home with Olympic medal. When we looked at the conversion rate in Germany, for example, the rate was close to 90%. The Americans converted 104% in Salt Lake City. Well, that problem can only lie one place. <laughs> it lies in the realm that is occupied by sports psychology. Right? And over the years, what we have learned to do is recognize that there's a tremendous amount of growth in pressure. Uh, pressure is a tremendous opportunity to grow. Uh, our Olympic men's hockey coach, Mike Babcock, who also coaches in the National Hockey League with the Toronto Maple Leafs, talks about the privilege of pressure. He talks about you have pressure because you have a chance. <laughs> if you don't have a chance, you don't have any pressure. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a woman named Kelly McGonigal who is a researcher at Stanford, who's done more research in the last 15 years on stress and stress management probably than anyone else. And she has begun to recognize that people don't die because of stress, they die because of their perception of stress. People who see stress as stressful actually develop all the physiological responses that you expect from stress, Carni uh, blockages in arteries, et cetera, et cetera. People see it, who see it as growth producing don't get those blockages at all. And so pressure is an opportunity to grow and develop. It's also about responding and recovering from setbacks. Many, many years ago, Martin Seligman, the renowned uh, American psychologist and researcher, um, studied the American Olympic swim team. And he gave them a test uh, that measured what he called their explanatory style. How do they explain away success or failure? And so an optimist, for example, explains away failure as it happened, it happens once, but it won't happen again. <laughs> That's the way a pessimist explains success. It happened, I don't know where the hell it came from, but I was lucky this time. And the reverse is true when it comes to failure, of course, uh, or to, to, to the reverse is true in terms of the optimist. If they succeed, they say, yeah, I succeed. That's the way I am. I generally succeed. 
And pessimists, when they fail, say, yeah, this is me. I generally fail. And he gave them these tests, and he had, the, he had the coaches rate their athletes on their ability to bounce back from disappointing news, just from their own observations of their athletes. He had them write a test. It was amazing when you looked at the correlation. The coaches could actually predict, but so could his test predict, which swimmers would bounce back from disappointment. And so in the morning swim, when they swam their event, each coach was instructed to give a time to the swimmer that was not accurate, that actually was a slower time than they actually swam. <laughs> and then they looked to see who would bounce back when they swam again in the evening. Well, those people who had a more optimistic, more resilient personality bounced back a lot quicker and swam even faster than the real time in the evening swim. And so resiliency is also about your ability to recover. And of course, it's about your ability to perform under pressure. Now, one of the problems in sports psychology uh, comes from the fact that we use the word psychology in our name. And I'm going to speak to that in a moment, but I want to tell you about our little plan for today. So let's take a performer. They are here, so you are here. And let's say you want to get to here. You'd like to be here. So this is how it works, right? Your coaches know this. Look, it's just a, just a straight line, right? Is that right? What's the line look like? The line looks like this, doesn't it? And the sports psychology skills work right here. That's where we use them. We do not learn at the high points in our life. We learn at the low points. Most of life's lessons are not very friendly. <laughs> and they occur with disappointment, setback, failure. I'm constantly saying to athletes who get really upset about failure, what are you doing in sport if you can't deal with disappointment? <laughs> sport is all about learning to deal with disappointment. In any sports season, it's like you take 10 years of normal life and you crush it into one year. There's so much opportunity to grow and develop because there's so many setbacks and disappointments. And you have the other range, too. You have the successes as well. Now, I said that part of the problem is the word psychology. Still, in this day and age, there are many athletes who look at sports psychology and think it means that they if they're going to see a sports psychologist, there must be something wrong with them. And that's because traditional psychology, as it was developed by Sigmund Freud and Jung and many others, focused on dysfunction. They centered in on people who were not adapting well to life, who were not performing well in life. And it's a much needed profession, of course. But in sports psychology, we went way the heck over here. We went to the other side of that continuum. And we said, what do exceptional athletes do in here, performers in here, that make them so darn exceptional out here? And we studied the Ingmar Stenmars of this world. We studied the Billie Jean Kings. We studied those athletes who were incredible at producing under pressure. And slowly in listening to them, we came up with a curriculum. In listening to Ingmar Stenmar and Jack Nicholas and others who talked a great deal about imagery. For example, Stenmaier late in his career would just train with two gates. And they said to him, how come you only train with two gates? And he said, there's a left turn and there's a right turn. He said, the rest I can do in my head. <laughs> Nicholas said, I never hit a golf ball, not once, not in practice, not in competition, without first imaging the flight of the ball and then rehearsing what I had to do to make that happen. And over time, we developed a curriculum. And so if you were getting physically fit, you know what to work on. You know about power, you know about flexibility, you know about cardiovascular endurance, and you know about strength. Well, if you're going to get mentally fit, what do you work on? You work on perspective. How do you choose to look at things? The, percep the perspective that you take in any situation is critical. And it's something you have within your own control. Life chooses the information. You choose the frame you put around that information. And so there are many, many skills under that area of perspective. Some of them have to do with how you talk to yourself. Some of them have to do with how you can reframe things. Some athletes, Muhammad Ali was a good example, use affirmation 
I am the greatest. Right? Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. He had all kinds of things that he used that kept him on his game. It kept him on his perspective, right? And in the middle of all of this, I'll come to the other areas in a minute, but in the middle of all of this is the important thing, is the person. I have represented that by the self. And so because I hate doing veneer, I, I, wanted, I wanted to leave you at least with one solid skill that, that, that you can get your hands around or your head around in this instance. And so I want to talk about the important first step in any, with any performer, and that is the development of self-awareness. Uh, in truth, if you are coaching anybody in any field, what are you trying to do? You're trying to develop self-awareness and self-responsibility in this other person. That's ultimately what all coaching boils down to, developing self-awareness and self-responsibility in another human being. But those phrases are quite inaccurate. At least in English, they're quite inaccurate. Because the truth is, let's take the term self-awareness. It's actually yourself that does the awareness. It is yourself that does the noticing. So let's back up from this. I have written near self, mind, body, feelings. The truth is, you are not your body, you are not your mind, and you are not your feelings. You get messages from those three all the time, but they are not who you are. The unique thing about you as a human being, what differentiates you from other more primitive animals is that you have the capacity to move to a place where you can notice what's happening. You can observe your thoughts, for example. Then who's watching? Those of us who went to school for too long, we tend to think we are our mind. We're not our mind. Thank God you're not your mind. The mind, said Lao Tse, is, Lao Tse, is like an untrained horse. It runs everywhere. Sit down and try to meditate and see how much control you have over your mind. Truth of the matter is, Lao Tse is exactly right. We have what we call monkey mind. It jumps from here to here to here to here to here. In fact, I used to spend way too much time working with my athletes, uh, trying to get them to change what they were saying to themselves. And now, I simply tell them that's the way the mind is. Don't take it seriously. None of it's factual. Or to put it another way, the voice in your head is not God. It's just stories you're making up. I don't think this is going to go very well. I'm really tired today. I don't know why I'm practicing. There's nothing factual about any of that stuff. You're just making it up. Now, primitive animals respond through their wiring. They are what we call reactive. A snake does snake-like things. It doesn't stop and consider its options. It strikes. A deer freezes when it's under pressure. A stingray stings, right? In those situations, we, <clears throat> we have the capacity to step back and notice what we're experiencing and then make choices. We can be in control of ourselves. There's a psychologist in the United States, who, a woman I have a tremendous amount of respect for, named Tara Brack, and she teaches, uh, she's also a, a Buddhist meditation teacher. And the other day she said something very wise. She said, revenge is the laziest form of grief. Revenge is the laziest form of grief. I'm upset, so I just strike back. And I just do to somebody else what they did to me. Well, if you're gonna learn to be in charge of you, then the first thing you need to be able to do is step back and notice what you're going through. And a lot of athletes initially aren't anxious to do this because they have this fear that if they go inside and they notice their feelings and they notice what their mind is saying and they notice that their heart rate is increased or their palms are, 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 are tight or their shoulders are raised, something at the body level, then, then that's going to dominate me. It's going to control me. The fact of the matter is, the minute you start to notice it, the minute you notice it, it starts to dissipate. Being aware is the first step. If I asked you to close your eyes and just scan your forehead and your jaw, 
and you noticed a little tightness in your jaw, would I have to stop and teach you anything? No, you just get rid of the tightness in your jaw. I didn't have to stop and teach you anything. You can take care of that. And so here you are, you notice what you're thinking, you notice what's going on at the body level, and now you make a choice. What am I going to do? Am I going to change my perspective? Am I going to run different images right now? Am I going to lower or raise, raise my arousal level? Am I going to redirect my attention? See, ultimately, what's performance all about? What do you choose to pay attention to? Do you put your attention on things that are productive and help you in this race, or are you focusing on how, you're, how the, the person in the lane beside you is doing, you're focusing on what's running through your brain, all of that stuff, or are you on the main cues that you need to pay attention to to be quick as you head down the pool? Okay. And so what does the curriculum look like? Well, let's move to imagery. Despite the fact that all of us, or many of us in this room, come from different cultures, and I think almost all of us come from different families in this room, we actually all spoke the same first language, all of us. We all spoke imagery. Yo-Yo Ma, the concert cellist, calls imagery the forgotten language of our youth. And here's the thing about imagery. When you talk about it, people tend to think, oh, that's really neat. Oh, what a great expression that is. But actually, what I'm about to tell you is true at the cellular level. Imagery is the language of performance. Good coaches get that. Imagery is the language of performance. People cannot do things they can't imagine. What's our job? Help them see what's possible. Right? Well, one of you hasn't struggled with something. Maybe it's a new computer program. And someone comes along and tells you about it in a totally different way than somebody else told you about it. You know, it's just like Lotus Notes. I mean, you can surround the data and take it in as a unit. Why are you taking in one piece at a time? And in one instance, you go from being incompetent to being competent. What happened to you? You had a realization. Something just became real to you. What does that mean? You can see it. You can see it. People need clarity. They can't perform at high levels without clarity. Imagine a golf pro, golf pro who stood behind a golfer and kept yelling, hit the ball further. You wouldn't be much of a golf pro when you were doing that. But when you paint incredibly clear pictures of what the backswing looks like, what the stance looks like, now people can start to imagine those things. It was interesting that Bob this morning, uh, when he spoke in this room, was talking about how Early on, he just showed the practice schedule to Michael Phelps, but now he just gives it to all his athletes. For years, I've said to coaches, hand out your practice schedule. Let them see your practice schedule because it gives them clarity on what you're trying to do. If I asked you to go for a run, how many of you would commit to run with me? Not many until you knew how far and how fast. How can you possibly know the effort and everything required if you don't have any idea of those dimensions? So there's many sides to imagery and many parts of it. But as leaders and as coaches, learning to communicate so that you create images and so starting to think in terms of what images do I want to create in my athletes. Debbie Muir, the synchronized swimming coach, coached many gold medalists, including Carolyn Waldo and Michelle Cameron. Carolyn was uh, in, in this room last night. She talked about driving to practice and, and going through in her head how she wanted to communicate with her athletes so that she created the right images in those athletes. And then she said something very wise to me. She said, because as you know, Peter, the meaning of the communication is the response you get. I think I told them all to go left, but when half the team goes right, <laughs> clearly I did not communicate in a way that created the right picture in those athletes' heads. Energy management. I've just 
finished writing my third book, uh, which is out now, and it's called Thriving in a 24-7 World. And uh, I wrote it as a novel. I wrote it as a story. And so it's about a sports psychologist who has been to nine Olympic Games, which is somehow exactly the same number I've been to. And uh, the only thing I changed is I, I married a different woman in the book. And uh, although she ended up a lot like my current wife, who has always been my wife. Um, however, in this book, uh, one of the things that, one of the pictures I'm using to help people learn a little bit about energy management is, is this. The whole area of energy management is connected to what we call in sport choking. Choking. You see, when arousal level gets very high, attentional focus narrows. You see? And when a fo attentional focus gets too narrow, what happens is we miss critical information. We miss information that, that, that we would normally have at our disposal. It's sort of like, you know when someone's really angry and you say to somebody else, I'm not going to talk to him right now. I have to wait until he calms down before I go over there. I intuitively, we all know this. High arousal leads to narrow focus and mistakes, mistakes. So what I do is I encourage athletes to start to think about themselves like a thermostat and not like a thermometer. And that's my picture for them. Now, a thermometer measures the temperature of whatever environment it's in. If it's hot, it becomes hot. If it's cold, it becomes cold, right? Whereas a thermostat, you actually set it. You decide. You decide what temperature you need to be at. And so with the athletes I work with, for example, they'll put a number on it, you know? I need to be at a 7 out of 10, whatever that means to them. And we usually find that number by looking at successful competitions they've had and figure out what's the sort of optimum place for you to get to, and then how can you control your arousal level when you get there. And in my last two minutes, I'm not going to be able to teach you a ton of skills, but the primary skill that I use with elite athletes in, in controlling their arousal level is breathing. I teach them how to center. I teach them how to breathe properly. I teach them how to lower their arousal level. At the World Championships in Turkey in women's basketball, our women's team who I work with, we were shooting 51% from the foul line. I had them simply use a simple breathing technique when the referee gave them the ball, focus on the diaphragm, and then on the exhalation, drop your shoulders, bend your knee, bounce the ball, do whatever you normally do and shoot. We never shot below 81% a game. Just by adding a simple breathing technique that you could use behind the blocks, you can use on the blocks. It's a, all it does is move your body into the right position and do what you need to do anyway. And the last area is focus. And the biggest problem with focus is that people get caught up in trying to pay attention to way too many things. It's the multitasking that goes on in our world. My friend, uh, decathlon coach Andy Higgins has a great quote. He says, focusing on everything is focusing on nothing. I recognize that is a very fast whirlwind tour through the model of sports psychology. Obviously, each and every one of these areas we could spend days in, uh, but that's just to give you a sense of the types of things that come into producing mentally fit athletes in the same way that we produce physically fit athletes. You work as diligently on these things as you would work on your physical fitness. I thank you very much for your attention.